Have you ever heard the phrase, demon time? Demon time. It's a, it's a slang phrase that is commonly used today, specifically among Gen Zers and young millennials. It's used on social media and by some, popularized by some celebrity artists. If you're, I don't know, in your maybe late 30s, in your 40s like me and my wife, and any, any age above that, you're probably like, demon who? <laughs> demon what? Demon time. Uh, it is part of this generation's vernacular. Demon time carries a few different meanings. And here are some of the more common ones. When people say that, they, um, that I'm in demon time or somebody is in demon time, it is a time when someone feels like an absolute lowercase g God, and they feel like they can do anything. So they'll say, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm on demon time. It's usually used in the context of video games where you have somebody who is just, you know, they absolutely are wrecking their competition, and they would say in the chat or something like that, I, I'm on, man, he or she is on demon time. Here's another meaning that demon time usually refers to the time of the day, usually, Mike, between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. when there is like nonstop foolery. Or when the time of the evening where sexual desire is ripe and people throw off all kind of moral, moral restraints. De demon time. It's kind of like, it's trying to, not exactly, but in some way, trying to mimic like the purge. I don't know if y'all have ever seen the movie The Purge. It's a, a time that happens late in the Early, early eve or, or late evening or early morning, and people will go out and they'll put on masks and they'll commit murder and they'll do all of this stuff. They, they will act as my dad, my late father used to say, a plum fool. So they, so they say demon time is when you get an opportunity, it's, uh, it's endorsing this acting a plum fool. De demon time, for the most part, is used to describe, and this was very common, and it came in vogue during COVID, and it refers to people who say that they will go on live stream and stream their sexually explicit content for money. They, they, this is a time in the world where they, the strip clubs, for example, were shut down, and people then had to find another route to do their sexually explicit stuff. And so people took advantage of internet and live streaming and started to put together videos that they would put out, and then people dubbed it OnlyFans. But you go on to this video or this live stream, and you can watch and view and tip people for their sexually explicit content. Y'all's favorite Artist Beyonce actually used it in one of her songs, but I'm gonna let that. I'm not gonna even. I'm not gonna touch that because I don't want to get the beehive stirred up. But there's this generation, this culture seems to have some fixation on the demonic. Not just this generation; it's been in other generations as well. But but you know who else has a fixation? about the demonic is Hollywood. I just want to give you the list of movies that were released this year related to the demonic, Insidious, The Red Door, When Evil Lurks, The Nun 2, Malum, The Pope's Exorcist, It Lives Inside. You see, many people either refer to the demonic flippantly, demon time, or simply shrug the demonic off as fairy tale. 
that it's all make-believe. It's just horror entertainment. None of it is actually real. There is no devil, and there are no demons. But the Bible says differently. The scripture speaks to their reality and doesn't joke around about their existence or activity in the world. And more than that, the Bible tells us that everyone, hear this, who is not a believer in Jesus, which used to be you and I, is under the devil's influence. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says this, We know that we, Christians, are from God. Hear it. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Christians, those who have placed trust in Jesus, we are from God. We are with God. We are in God. We, are, we belong to God. But the whole world, John says, did I say whole? Did he say the whole world? Lies in the power of the evil one. Hear it. The whole unbelieving world of people are subject to his evil influence. The whole unbelieving world. The world that you and I used to belong to. I mean, who do you think is the spiritual force behind human acts of evil in the world? Human acts of evil like human and sex trafficking. Who do you think is behind the human acts of evil in the world? Evil like slavery. Not just transatlantic slavery, but slavery, modern day slavery as well. Who do you think is behind evil acts of murder? Oppression. False religions. Injustice. Answer, it's not God. It's the devil and his demons. Hear God's word through the pen of the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes, and you, those of us in the room who are Christians online and across the ages, you Christians were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, Following the course or the system of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's AKA the devil. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, in non Christians among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You know, in high school, there was always, y'all probably will remember this, at least one individual who loved to see people fight other people. Or break the rules. Y'all remember this? Some of y'all may have been this person. Thank God for salvation. See, see it's, this, it's this example of somebody comes up to Raymond or comes up to a, a brother or a sister, particularly in this case a, a man or a young boy or teenager, and says, hey, Raymond was talking crazy about you in the hallway. And I even heard him mention something about your mama. You know, your, your mama, like your mama that just passed. If I were you, I, you know, I put my hands on, because Raymond, Raymond said that if he see you after school, it's on and popping. Like, I'm just telling you, I ain't trying to start nothing. I'm just telling you what I heard. If I was, up to, if I was you, I'd go on and get a jump on him. I'd go on and take care of him before he take care of you. Do you know what my late father and my mom used to call them type of people, those type of people? Y'all probably know this. We used to, they used to call them instigators. 
instigators. It's someone who tries to egg you on, push you to do something for their own twisted enjoyment. The devil, brothers and sisters, and demons are known for a number of things, and one of them is that they are spiritual instigators. They seek to stir us up in, in our sinful rebellion against God and our evil against others. They are spiritual instigators. Now, though their presence and influence and activity in the unbelieving world of people are often overt or covert and deceptive, there are times when they are up front and in your face, when they manifest themselves in people's lives in real, tangible ways. Such was the case with the man in our text today. From this account in Mark chapter 5, we see some central characteristics about demons that I want to show you. In verse 2, the first thing that I want you to see after Jesus, he comes to the other side, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out the boat, the Bible says, a man with an unclean spirit stopped right there. First thing that you need to understand about demons is this. Demons are morally impure. Did you check the, the, the adjective unclean spirit? In, in our passage, the demon is referred to as an unclean spirit. The nature of these non-physical beings, these non-physical demons is corrupt. They are perverted. They are immoral. They are unrighteous. They only promote and produce things that are according to their nature. Anybody remember a movie that came out in 1948? Yeah, some of y'all like, I wasn't even born then. Sit down somewhere. Huh? Yeah, just be quiet. We know. Yeah, you're just young. In 1948, it's called Gremlins. I mean, 1984, sorry, 1984. I was like, well, I wasn't even born in myself. Thank y'all for catching that. 1984. Y'all didn't know I was, I'm Methuselah. That's my nickname is Methuselah. 1984. Sorry, 1984. Y'all remember this movie? Those gremlins may look cute and cuddly, but if you expose them to water, or you feed them after midnight, the sinister gremlins come out, like the real gremlins come out. Does anybody remember what these gremlins in the movie were called? They were called mogwais. So, so they look cuddly here, but, but then this is, this is yeah, that's, they look cute, but then that's... That's, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, some of y'all remember. Uh-huh. Magwai is actually a, a, a Cantonese term, a Chinese term. You know what it means? Devil or demon. Similar to gremlins, demons may disguise themselves as angels of light. They may look cute and cuddly, but they are always up to no good. And let me pause here to give a brief application break. Because I think I need to tell somebody here, and I need to tell our church, don't play with the demonic. Don't participate in seances. Don't be dabbling in black magic or any type of occult practices. Don't do drugs. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, the drugs can put you into an alternate state of mind that makes you more susceptible to demonic temptation and influence. Who hasn't heard somebody who is hooked on meth or fentanyl or anything of that nature who says, I heard voices last night. 
There are voices in my head that are telling me to do some evil or wicked thing. When you make, you do drugs, it oftentimes is used as a gateway by the demonic to, to put more influence and exert more influence and control in a person's life. The demons are morally impure, but here's the second thing that you need to understand about demons. Demons are stronger than humans. We see this evidence in the fact, watch this, in verses 3 through 4. It says that the man lived in the tombs and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with the chain. Because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Do you hear it? Did you you read it? Human, Human, hear it, human intervention and inventions of domination and control couldn't stop this demon from tormenting this man. Chains, shackles, human inventions. They tried to intervene to put these chains and shackles on this man, and the demon empowered this man so much that he broke out of them. He didn't use no flathead screwdriver (laughs) <laughs> or some, some, type of, some type of wrench, he broke them with his bare hands. Broke them. Shattered the chains, the shackles were on his feet. Shattered them. Uh, the same is true today. There are, there are no human inventions and interventions that ultimately can control a demon. I hope y'all are hearing this today. You can burn all the sage you want. Demons will still be right there. They'll probably be smoking sage with you. (laughs) You can burn all the sage you want. It ain't going to do nothing. You can situate all the crystals you want around your house. The the demon's just going to go around and say, oh, that's pretty. Burn all the sage you want. Put all the crystals you want around your house. Anoint yourself and your house with blessed holy water if you want. It ain't going to do nothing. You can hear me. Hear this well. Hear this clearly. You can even put crosses up in your car, on your desk, in your purse, or around your neck, or tattoo it on your body. All of that in and of themselves, will not cause demons to back up off you or to expel a demon from somebody else's life. I even heard, I, Pastor Brooks, Chris, I even heard, honey, I heard just yesterday as, as I was scrolling, don't, don't judge me, as I was scrolling through TikTok that, that somebody posted uh, um, a message that this woman was giving, she seemed to be, prob- I, honestly, I don't have any reason to doubt her Christianity, but she was standing on stage in front of the church and was telling the church, we need to get loud when we get in here. Now, I'm all about making a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's scripture, right? But that's not what she was talking about. She was saying, we need to get loud up in here. And she went into this frenzy. We need to get loud up in here. The louder you yell and you cry and you shout, it will cause the devil and his demons to back up off you. Where that in the Bible? Because see, what we do, what we do, Kevin, what we do is what some of us do is we tend to take scriptures that we read in the Bible and then we misinterpret them and misapply them. 
we overextend the application and therefore we think that the Bible is teaching something that is actually not. So she referred to how the Bible says that the devil is the serpent, is, is the Satan is like a serpent. He is described as a serpent or characterized as a serpent. Amen. True. Where she messed up is she started taking things that are true about an actual physical serpent and then applying that to Satan. See, the, the Bible only tells us that he's a serpent in the sense that he's cunning, in the sense that he is deceitful. That's where the application needs to stop. That's where the application of the Bible is trying to focus us in on. What she then said was, well, you know, serpents, they, they, they can feel vibrations in their tummy when they're crawling on the ground. You got to say it like that because then that's when folk just believe you, right? Because if we don't read our Bibles, we just believe anything because it just sounds like somebody preaching. Ooh, she's saying, it's, 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 and they feel the vibrations in their, in their, in their belly, and, and, and they can feel your presence. That's why when you see a snake, you need to stomp and yell and scream because it, it, it allows the, the serpent and the snake to back up off you and to flee. Sounds good. All you're going to be doing is, is messing your vocal cords up because the devil, ain't, he ain't scared of us screaming. He's not scared of our praise and worship. He doesn't back up because we have a war cry unto the Lord. Raise your shofar, believers, and blow the horn of your praise. And the devil will back up off of you. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says resist the devil, submit to God, and he will flee from you. The devil is stronger than us. So all this stuff that we think we're doing and the yelling and the screaming, man, the devil been yelled at and screamed at since creation of humanity. He ain't scared of the of the octave and the volume of our praise and worship. That doesn't scare him. It may scare us. Woo! See, some of y'all are like, oh, see? You see how that did you? That doesn't scare the devil. That doesn't scare demons. They are stronger than us. So you need something, or should I say someone else that is needed if you're going to have the devil to back up off you. Here's the, here's the next thing that I need you to see about demons that, that this, this text teaches us. It shows us that demons cause turmoil. Verse 5. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, we don't believe, hear this, hear this section well, family. We do not believe demons are the perpetrators behind every case of manic disorder or mental illness or derangement in a person's life. On one hand, the cause of some mental breakdowns is due to our frailty as humans. Just as our bodies are prone to get sick, our minds, our brains can be adversely affected as well. Some people were born with these type of conditions. Some had an early onset of them in their childhood or adolescent stage. While others experienced significant trauma and it took a toll on them mentally and their mind and body, it just broke under the immense pressure and pain. So all mental illness and derangement and manic episodes and all that is not always due to demonic influence. On the other hand, the cause of mental breakdowns, some of them, is due to our fallenness as humans, our sinfulness. For example, we get addicted to drugs that damage our brains and therefore, it then produces hallucinations and anxiety and depression and fear. 
And then there is, of course, the cases where a person is sane but sadistic. Because everybody that got mental stuff going on ain't always out of their mind. Are you following? Like, they don't, they're not always walking around talking to themselves. They look just like you and I and even act like just you and I and can hold rational conversations. But they are sadistic. See, these are people, for example, who are, who are dark, twisted criminal mastermind like Jeffrey Dahmer, like Adolf Hitler, like Osama bin Laden, like terrorists, like racial extremists and religious extremists. Do you get the point? They, there are a lot of people that are sane in terms of they have their mental capacity, their faculty. They don't have any cognitive issues, development issues. They think just like you and I in terms of capacity and capability, but they're demented in their thinking. I mean... I mean, what else was there? I mean, did you, did you see the videos of Hamas? Did, did you see? Did, did you see how calculated they were? Did you see that they planned this a year ago? Did, did you see how they had the wherewithal to go into certain communities? Same but sadistic. Often the devil and his demons simply take advantage of these things and attempt to make things worse, to add on to them, or to hijack them for their destructive purposes. However, in this man's life, here in our passage, a demon was the direct cause of his personal chaos. His personal turmoil came in the form. Did you read it in the Bible with me? In verse 5, he was continually in mental, emotional distress and physical self-harm. Did y'all read the Bible with me? I hope you brought your Bible with you or on your phone. Night and day, he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. I need to pause because I think right here the Lord wants to help somebody either here online or maybe this is for somebody you know who is at the place in your life where you may be contemplating hurting yourself. And, and, and I feel like the Lord, through this passage, wants you to know that, that those intrusive thoughts or voices that you may be hearing in your head telling you to unalive yourself or hurt yourself are not from God. Don't do it. Don't do it. But don't do it because God has better plans for you. Don't, don't do it. Because there is nothing that God cannot get you through. Don't, don't do it because there are folk in the room who can attest to the fact that I was in a dark time in my life. I was going through a divorce. I lost my job. I was going through sickness. And there was a time where I didn't know how I was going to make it out. But I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to depend on God. And they are sitting here. I can see some of them in the building right now. They smiling. They in a better place mentally because they trusted God. And God brought them through. Amen. I thought I was going to have somebody that was been delivered from a dark. Anybody been delivered from a dark time in your life where you were struggling with depression and anxiety and all of those type of things? You were struggling with trauma and struggling with a surprise event, a hurtful event, some type of level of trauma and pain, and God got you through it? Don't do it. People can tell you in here. They can tell you that God, God has better for you. There's life beyond. There's life after. 
It's life after. So, so what do we do? I just, I'm, I'm going to unpause in just a second. What do we do? I, I want, I want when, when we have trauma and dark times and dark nights of the soul, what do we do? Do we, as Christians, we, we don't take our own lives. We don't do those things. And hear me, I know there's been some Christians that have, thank God that our salvation is secure. Suicide is not the, the uh, sin of blasphemy. So pr- praise Praise God that a Christian, although it was traumatic, praise God that their salvation is secure. They are with Jesus today. So we're not talking about that and condemning people, but we're talking about those of us who are yet alive, who have a choice in the matter. You, 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 here's what we need to do. This is in Psalm 119. This is actually the, the chapter uh, that our teens and our junior highs are going through right now. Our junior highs and high schoolers are going through. It's in verse 25. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. The psalmist says, my life is down in the dust. Anybody ever been there? He says this. He's praying to God, give me life through your word. There it is. He, there it is. He says, I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. How do you handle grief? How do you handle sorrow? How do you handle times when you are in the dust, when you are in the dark? Brothers and sisters, we go to the book. We go to God in prayer. We go to his word. His word is what strengthens us. We go to God in prayer. The book tells us to go to him in prayer. The book tells us to go to him in prayer, to depend on his word and to go to his people. Can I tell you this is the reason why when you go through dark times, I know I'm I'm pressing pause here. We're going to get back to the sermon, but I feel like I just need to press in here a little bit. Do you know... This is the reason why you don't need to stop reading your Bible when you go through tough times. This is the reason why you don't need to put down your personal devotion when you go through tough times. This is the reason why you don't need to divorce yourself or separate yourself, isolate yourself from the church when you're going through dark times. Because... We sing the word. We pray the word here. We can encourage each other in the word here at the gathering. And in your own personal time with the Lord. Back to the text. This man is out of control. He is out of his mind and he is out of place. Where is he? Yeah. He is living in the tombs, among the tombs and on the mountains. Y'all, he ain't got no, he ain't got no cabin on the side of the mountain. This ain't, this ain't sandals resort. He didn't build him a cabin. He's roaming. He's roaming. From tomb to tomb, mountain on side of the mountain, roaming in places that are not meant for human habitation. He is out of place. Now, this is where the account makes a turn for the better. Y'all ready for the better? It, it, it makes a turn in verse 6, but it also makes, it continues in verse 1 because Jesus steps on the shore. <laughs> Jesus steps on the shore, and according to verse 6, the Bible says, when he saw Jesus from a distance. It's a good thing when, when Jesus steps on the scene. Here's, here's the point that I need you to see, that demons recognize, respect, and respond to the person and authority of Jesus. I want you to see the respect first. Notice, read the Bible with me. Notice, when he saw Jesus, verse 6, he ran and knelt down before him. (laughs) R-E-S-P-C-T. Terrell, that's respect. He ran and fell down. And notice the he in the text, the he, if you keep reading in context, it's not the man, it's the demon that's in the man. He runs and he kneels down at Jesus. That's respect. The demons, the demons, watch this. You also see it, watch it. Um, They say in verse 7, at the end of verse 7, I beg you. (laughs) Verse 10, and he begged him. The demon begged Jesus. They needed permission. The demons knew who they were talking to. They didn't declare and decree. 
nothing to Jesus. They didn't demand anything to Jesus. They begged him. Lord. Jesus. Hey there. Good to see you. You get the point? They, they recognized him. Watch what they say in verse 7. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? They recognized him. <laughs> and then they respond. L listen, how did they respond? Look at the text. Verse 8 says, for he told him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus says, what is your name? The demon immediately answered. Now, now have you ever seen, I got I to move, but have you ever seen uh, some deliverance services where, where, where Christians are like cat, trying to cast out demons and folk? And uh, you have these, these brothers and sisters in Christ that, you know, I, I think they're, you know, for the most, I think they're genuine believers. But they ask a demon they name. And the demon ain't said nothing. Have y'all seen this? I said, what's your name? Do you hear me in the name of Jesus? What is your name? And they got to say it like five, six, seven times. Not with Jesus. See, G see demons can be stubborn with us. Oh, but when Jesus stepped in, what's your name? The demon didn't, didn't sit there silently. The demon just been to be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm not talking to you. The demon answered Jesus because they respected him, not in the sense of out of, out of, out of a genuine, sincere thing, but they knew that he was, has greater authority and has authority over them. They knew who he was. They responded to them. They answered his question. What is your name? He asked him, and the, the demon immediately said, my name is Legion. Do you notice they responded? W watch it. That the demons begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the region. Verse 10. The demons in verse 12 begged Jesus send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. Do you know that they had to wait? They, they for permission. Do, do you see it? Jesus says. <laughs> The scripture says, verse, verse 13, so he gave them permission. Can you see them there sitting there? They're just sitting there waiting because they can't do nothing until Jesus gives them permission to do it. They respond to him. They respond to the person in authority of Jesus. But, you know, this account is really about showcasing Jesus. It ain't about the demons. And so I want to give you three truths as we walk this sermon to a close that I think we need to walk away with in regards to Jesus and demons. Here's the first thing, that Jesus has supreme authority over demons. Do you notice in this, when you read this passage with me, that the demons have no control over this whole exchange? They have no control. They're not directing anything. They are subject to Jesus' wishes and commands. They got to beg Jesus. Then they got to they gotta implore him to cast them out and send them into some pigs. And then they got to wait and sit there. You know, it's like you as a parent with your kid. It's not the same thing. Sometimes kids can buck against your authority. I get that. But, you know, they, ain't, they can't do something until you give them permission to do something. This is what Jesus demonstrates. He has supreme authority over demons. Here's the second one, that Jesus frees people from demonic influence. He frees this guy. He gave them permission, and the unclean spirit, excuse me, came out. This, there was one demon that apparently, I guess apparently was like the, the head demon in charge, the one that was speaking. But there were multiple demons in this man, and they all came out. They entered into the pigs, and if you had any doubt about the purpose of demons and their intent, just look at what they did to the pigs. They entered into the pigs. It said it was about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. They drowned there, all of 
that good bacon. Gone. Pork chops, gone. Bacon bits, gone. <laughs> Ham, gone. Ribs, gone. Chitlins, gone. Ham hocks, gone. No wonder they were upset. I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just joking. But they, they drowned them. They all drowned. They all drowned. Freed this man. The third thing and final thing I want you to see is that Jesus restores people's lives from demonic damage. He didn't just free this man. He restored. How do you know he restored him? Look at the text. The people came, verse 14, the, there were men that ran off, <laughs> they got scared, woo, they ran off, reported to the town, countryside, and people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed, what was he doing? Sitting there, that's restoration, because before, what was he doing? He was roaming around. He was sitting there, what's the next thing? He was sitting there, and he was clothed. Wait, wait. He was clothed. Another passage in, in Luke talks about how this man was naked. But Jesus delivered this man from demonic damage. He restored this man's life because now he's sitting, and now he's clothed, and now he is in his right mind. He's in his right mind. There's a bonus point that I need to put on here. It's not on the screen, but I need to mention it to you. That through faith in Jesus' perfect life, life and redemptive work, God the Father rescued us from the domain of darkness. A domain, a kingdom, a realm, hear this, that is marked by our depravity and is ruled by the devil and his demons. The Bible says that all of us who have placed trust in Jesus, that the Father rescued us. It's like a, man, it's like a Navy SEAL coming in to take, take to rescue a hostage. God swoops in in Christ, rescues us out of the domain of darkness and places us, transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus. So what are we to do with this message? What are we to do since we have been recipients of the grace of God in Christ who have been delivered from demonic influence? Because every Christian has. All of us in here have. Whether it was something subjectively going on in your actual life where there was like demonic influence in a, in a kind of a tangible, unique way, the reality is spiritually all of us used to be under his control. All of us used to be in his domain. All of us used to be in his world of darkness. But God in Christ snatched us out, transferred us, to the kingdom of his beloved son. What, what did he tell the man to do? Because that's what we need to do. He tells this man, listen, in this case, the man wanted to physically follow Jesus. You see it? Verse, verse, uh, verse 18. It says, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had, has had mercy on you. That's what we need to do, family. We need to be like the man in this text, that after Jesus, he has, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, we need to go home. We need to go to people. We need to go to them and tell them how much Jesus has done for us. What do we need to tell them? That there's freedom in Jesus. That you can be reconciled back to God, forgiven of your sins, and you can be emancipated 
from Satan and his demons and all of his dark, demonic influence and activity and presence in your life. There's a hymn that says, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Hear it, for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. And that is the word of our King, Jesus. There's freedom in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for teaching us today, for reminding us today. We are free from the devil and his demons. We are free from their influence and control in our lives as Christians. But God, somebody is here today. They are where we used to be. They're here and they are yet dead in their trespasses and sins. They are following, when they look at their lives, they are following the course of this world. The, the sinful course of this world. They're, they're following their passions, their sinful passions and desires. They, are, they may not know it, but they are following the prince of the power of the air. They're following the devil and his demons. God, will you, in this moment, as we pray for them, God, we pray that you will open their eyes to see that truth, to see their sinful depravity, to see the fact that they are spiritually in bondage to the devil and his demons. But more importantly, God, that they would see that you created them in your image to be in relationship with you, not with the devil and his demons. But that, that relationship was severed because of sin, and that's why you sent Jesus. That you love the world so much, Father, that you demonstrated your love in this way, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins to live a perfect life for us, to be raised from the dead. And they will trust in that good news of Jesus, in that message of Jesus, in the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus, that they can be forgiven and freed today. We pray for the Christian who's here, who is a believer, but they have yet to be baptized. Lord, we pray that you help them to make that decision today. And there may be Christians here who are looking for a church home. Maybe this is their first time or they're returning to us again. God, we entrust you to put it on their hearts, God, to make Harvest their home. Will you, will you help them, Lord, to make that decision? They won't put it off anymore. They'll be obedient to you, that they will trust you, and they will sense that you're leading, your Holy Spirit is leading them to become a part of this local church family where they are needed and where... We need them and where they can be a, of a mutual benefit. We all can be of a mutual benefit to one another. Help them in these moments, Father God, whoever needs to make these life-altering decisions, eternity-defining decisions, Lord, we pray that you, by your Spirit, will work in each heart that's in the room and grace them to make a decision to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord and or to obey Jesus in some form of fashion, now that they are Christians. We pray this all in Christ's name, and we pray you will bless us as we prepare our hearts to give. May you help us to give our first and our best back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.